Hi, my name is Lee Acey. I'm the director of the Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media. I would like to introduce you to Annie Burt, who is our first presenter in the Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media, Social Media Health Network uh, webinar series. We're excited about the webinar that we have uh, coming up for you today, uh, talking about employee engagement uh, through news delivery and, and social media on an internal, from an internal perspective. Uh, before we get into that, though, I'd like to share a few slides with a little bit of background about our Center for Social Media, uh, the Social Media Health Network, and uh, this webinar series that we're going to be doing, as well as some highlights of some coming events. So we'll just switch uh, here. Great. So this is our webinar series, as it says right there. Our Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media uh, was created in 2010, and our goal is to drive the adoption of social media within healthcare, uh, not just at Mayo Clinic, but uh, throughout the industry. We wanna look at how we can use these tools in research, in clinical practice, in education, as well as for the PR and marketing kind of applications that uh, we've all come to know and love, I guess. Uh, well, we do have a broader mission. It's not just about Mayo Clinic. As I said, we wanna help our colleagues in healthcare who want to find out how to apply these tools uh, to be able to do that as well and to provide an assist. Uh, we see ourselves as a catalyst. Uh, our job is to help reduce the activation energy to make it easier for those who are uh, interested in applying these tools, whether they are at Mayo Clinic or elsewhere, uh, to help uh, provide what you might call air cover, I guess, uh, for, uh, for other organizations that want to join with us. Uh, toward that end, we've created a group called the Social Media Health Network. Um, all Mayo Clinic employees are eligible to be members. Uh, just signing up with your mayo.edu email address. Otherwise, we have individual memberships and also uh, organizational memberships uh, that give full access to uh, the resources that, we're, that we've created. Um, just a couple of highlights, a couple of news highlights. Uh, yesterday, we launched uh, in collaboration with um, Fight Colorectal Cancer, which is a patient advocacy organization, uh, Strong, Strong Arm Selfie campaign, so it's hashtag Strong Arm Selfie. We encourage you to check out this post, and I will be tweeting some links uh, during the webinar, not in a distracting way, I assure you, uh, but be tweeting some links uh, using the hashtag MCCSM uh, that will you know, give you uh, access to some of these uh, uh, announcements that we have. Uh, the second is just to highlight that our social media, social media week at Mayo Clinic will be in June this year. Uh, we previously had held our annual conference in November, excuse me, in October. Yeah, that's a news flash. Uh, previously in October, this uh, this year is going to be in June uh, for the reason that uh, in September, we're going to be in Brisbane, Australia uh, for our first international uh, healthcare and social media conference in, um, in, in Brisbane, hosted by the Australian Private Hospital Hospitals Association. Uh, Lisa Ramshaw, who is the marketing and communications director for that organization had come to our events here in Rochester and said, hey, we got to bring you to Australia. Uh, so we finally were able to announce this morning officially that we're going to make that happen. So uh, make your plans. Uh, so some of our other social media health network programs, we've got uh, social media residency, which is our day long crash course. The, the next of these is, um, is a week from Monday here in Rochester, Minnesota. So if you are from if you just have always wanted to experience colder temperatures, uh, this would be your, your chance. Uh, then it will be March 9th in Phoenix and May 4th in, in Jacksonville. We're also uh, beginning today the, this series of monthly webinars. Um, the regular uh, registration for this is going to be $95 for non-members. For our Social Media Health Network members, we're making all of these uh, free. And today is our free sampler, uh, so to speak. So Annie Burt is... Uh, a colleague who's our director of employee engagement uh, here at Mayo Clinic. Uh, she's done some really great work along with her team on uh, helping to build the, the commitment uh, internally among our employees to the mission and to help helping leadership uh, interact and engage with, uh, with our staff. So uh, without giving uh, away too much more of her uh, presentation, I'd like to invite her to the microphone and ask her to uh, talk to us about what they what her team's been doing. Sure. Thank you, Lee, for that introduction and for inviting me to be a part of things today. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to talk with you a little bit about internal communications um, and specifically including some 
engagement strategies, some interactive and social tools um, to sort of uh, complement your overall internal news delivery strategy. All right, so uh, hello from Minnesota. We mentioned we're here in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, this is January, so we'd expect to see some pictures like this, but this photo was actually taken a couple of years ago on May 2nd, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story in a few minutes. Um, but first, I want to share just a little bit about Mayo Clinic for those of you who aren't familiar. You might already know that Mayo is based here in Minnesota. We've got academic medical centers in Arizona and Florida, as well as a health system that spans more than 70 locations. We are a complex organization. We've got about 60,000 employees that are spread across 38 states, so internal communications can be a challenge. The most important thing for you to know about Mayo Clinic is our primary value. The needs of the patient come first. It's a living, breathing part of our organization and something that every employee uh, works towards as a goal. And it um, colors all of the strategies that we implement uh, with internal staff communication and staff engagement. Uh, so now, back to May 2nd. Uh, we had 13 inches of snow dropped on us that day. And I, I'll just be honest that it was seriously depressing, even by Minnesota standards. I think most of the regular people of the world just went back to bed, but not Mayo Clinic employees. What I saw happen that day uh, was four nurses in my neighborhood. One of them was holding a full sheet cake in her arms. Uh, they waded through waist deep snow uh, because all of the buses had stopped running and they went into the street to flag down traffic knowing that most of the cars on the road would be Mayo Clinic employees trying to get to work. So they flagged down a truck and they said to the driver, we have patients who've come here for surgery and if we can't get downtown, our unit will be shorthanded. Can you help us get to work? He said, sure, they jumped in the truck and off they went. So this is um, a screenshot from our internal social network called Yammer, which some of you may use. And we used Yammer to capture that great story and share it with our staff, but we also used it to find more great stories like that on the day of this snowstorm. Um, but more importantly, our internal news delivery strategy uses all the tools that we have at our disposal to support and cultivate a culture where employees want to go above and beyond. We're looking for uh, that inspirational storytelling that can help our staff give that discretionary effort. Now, there is something special about Mayo Clinic that causes our employees to give their best like they did on May 2nd. And while it's an, intern while it's an integral part of our culture, um, it still requires some tending. So our internal news delivery strategy, um, it's interactive and it focuses on three-way communication to help us achieve that goal. So that's Mayo to employee, employee to Mayo, and employee to employee. And that interactivity helps us connect with, inform, and inspire our staff. So today we'll talk a little bit about how to implement some social tools and some interactive tools into your internal communication strategy. I've got a few examples of some things that are working for us and some tips for how to better work with maybe those skeptical leaders or stakeholders, um, as well as some ideas about how to keep your, your participation productive and respectful when you're in an online environment with your staff. And then we'll talk a little about measurement and how to collect information that's not just easy to get, but is meaningful to your work. So before we get too far into things, I do want to share a couple of statistics with you for some context. Uh, according to a 2012 survey, organizations are starting to warm up to the idea of using social media internally, but they've got a little bit of work to do when it comes to providing the tools that employees need. So 50% of organizations are encouraging employees to use social tools in relation to their jobs but only half of those, uh, half of them give no guidelines as to how employees should accomplish this. So employers want us to use new tools. They want to be on the cutting edge of employee communication, but they haven't always done all their homework. Um, just 30% of organizations are strategically deploying social technologies as a common company-wide solution. Um, but on the plus side, staff communication is the most popular reason for using social media. Allowing staff to share knowledge with each other is part of that process, and collaboration and knowledge sharing are two of the biggest perceived benefits. So before we jumped into our internal news strategy, we first considered our unique corporate culture. Every organization has a different personality. Mayo is complex and it's conservative. We're a healthcare organization, which means we have to consider patient privacy and HIPAA regulation in any of our communication strategies. Um, so if we were to add tactics that were out of sync with that corporate culture, they would be quite unlikely to succeed. We also had to assess our leadership's comfort level with staff interaction. So if, if your top leaders are not comfortable with things like 
uh, your staff using online forums to talk with each other in sort of a public way or in real time. Um, if they're not willing or able to get involved with the communication themselves and with any kind of regularity, um, working with them to better understand their goals before you launch a plan is really well worth your time. Here at Mayo, our leadership team is certainly getting comfortable with two and three way communication where they sort of have uh, less control over the message, but we still pick tactics that our leadership team is comfortable with and then we build as we go. Um, it's important to understand how your staff communicate as well as how they want to receive information. Um, asking questions like are they using mobile technology or do most of your staff have broad access to computers during their workday? Those things are important to know. Um, so for us, for example, we know that our employees prefer to get their news via our intranet and through email and that a growing number are using mobile technology, but it's still quite a smaller percentage as far as using mobile at work. We also know that our employees would like to be able to access the intranet off campus and that they would read more corporate news if they had better access. So this data helped to inform our strategy and the tactics that we picked to execute. Um, don't forget to talk to your technical partners, your other communications partners, to make a plan for any ongoing support or resources that you might need. It's critical that you think beyond the launch of a new tool or a vehicle. Employees are going to be watching to see if the new strategies you're creating are permanent, if um, the information you're sharing is going to become a reliable source of information. So planning ahead for that maintenance and those enhancements is an important part of the process. So as you start to integrate new tactics into your internal communication strategy, make sure that your plans support your overall goals for news delivery. These are my team's news delivery goals. So as a team, we work hard to provide staff with the information that they need to do their jobs, as well as to help Mayo Clinic be successful. We are called upon to be employee advocates, uh, leadership advisors, and client relations specialists. And sometimes those roles have conflicting needs. I hope that sounds familiar uh, to some of you so that I'm not alone in that boat. Um, we have to balance that operational news that employees need to know to do their jobs and the stuff they want to know about where to park and how to get their benefits. We have to balance that with the strategic objectives that our leaders want to communicate. And we try to do all that in a way that uh, inspires our staff and it's productive and transparent. So we believe that using interactive social tools as part of our internal news delivery strategy supports Mayo's values of teamwork and innovation because it offers a place for collaboration and learning. Those are our big internal goals for social media, uh, collaboration and learning. So social media sort of lets three-way conversations take place and we think that that helps our employees gain a greater understanding of Mayo's strategic objectives. So if we use the tools correctly, Mayo and its leaders can be part of conversations, they can learn from employee conversations, and they can do this in real time. Uh, we think social, st social strategies supplement our traditional internal news delivery mechanisms and they help us expand our reach within our employee population. So I'm going to do just a little show and tell here. Um, I would like to show you a couple of pieces of our intranet um, just to give you a feel for how our news is displayed to our staff. I'm just going to hop over quickly here. Just a second, bear with me. So I'm just going to go to our intranet. So this is our intranet homepage. Um, this is where we have taught our employees that they can go um, to get news that matters for Mayo Clinic. So um, if there's something going on, employees know this is the first place to look and our surveys indicate that this is where they expect to find information. The center part of our homepage here is called our news center and our top stories cycle through that photo carousel. Um, the headlines change daily and the stories are prioritized based on the news that's most important for staff to get. So today we have some headlines up about some initiatives that are happening here, as well as a nice feature story about one of our physicians who is also a patient. When you scroll down um, on the homepage, you can see there are more headlines, so staff can 
um, pick any of these stories that might be of interest to them. And they're a mix of operational news and strategic news, as I described. Um, and if you keep going, you can actually see that you can localize your news based on the campus in which you work. So there are about 10 different localized editions of our news that we make available on our homepage as well as um, in an email newsletter each Friday. So for those of us in the Rochester, Minnesota campus, we can see these are the headlines that apply to us today. Um, perhaps I split my time between Rochester and another campus and I could look at any of these um, and I could see what's going on at the place that's most important for me. If you continue scrolling down, there's a photo of the week here. This is one of our most popular employee news features. Um, the wide variety of photos kind of gives you a glimpse of life at Mayo Clinic. Um, you can learn more about activities that are happening here and what your fellow employees have been up to. And then the last thing at the bottom of our homepage is this the most box. Uh, we collect data that lets us know which of our stories are most read, most recommended, and most commented on. So for this week, you can see that the most recommended story is a, a nice feature involving some of our employees saving lives at 30,000 feet. Um, but the most read story is about uh, an announcement about our EMR, which is going to impact a lot of our employees. And the story that people are talking about is not surprising. It's a Q&A on our benefits plan. So it gives you a, a glimpse of what uh, content is most important to your, to your staff. If you click on any one of those stories, I've, I've pulled up one here, it was one of our most popular stories from 2014, it takes you into the news center itself. itself. And I'll just kind of go through an ana the anatomy of a story. Um, our stories are all categorized here with some navigation that makes sense to our staff. Um, you can see all of our stories always have some artwork and along the side, um, if you are interested in the stories in this category, you wanna learn more about Mayo in Action and how our staff are caring for others, you can see some content here that you might enjoy. Um, this story is about a five-year-old girl who lost her um, special blankie in about 49,000 pounds of linens, went into our laundry service on accident, and staff um, did everything they could, and they got this little girl's blanket back to her. It was just a very heartwarming kind of nice story. So uh, in this case, these buttons here show some interactivity that let our staff engage with our content in a way that's comfortable for them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. You can recommend a story, which is uh, much like the like button on Facebook. Um, you can see this story has almost 34,000 views, so it's a popular story that people uh, were reading, certainly. I can send this to, co to a coworker by email if I want to highlight um, some content and say, uh, you know, hey, did you see this story? I can even print it. Um, and a lot of our retirees um, and our volunteer staff like this feature. They like to print certain stories and have them out on their desk so people can read them. Um, we pull some related content on each story, so if you liked this story, you might also enjoy these. And then uh, the bottom part of each story here is a feature that allows our staff to have an online conversation with their peers and subject matter experts and other stakeholders on a topic. So we allow, um, on every news article that we produce, we allow employees to leave a comment. Um, if you've been involved with any of the work in the Social Media Center, you know that Mayo has a very robust social media code of ethics that applies um, to our staff when they are using social media tools, whether they're inside Mayo or out on social media tools out in the world. Um, so we link directly to that social media code of ethics so that when you leave a comment here, you understand this is what you're signing up for. You're going to be professional. You won't be dismissive. Our public affairs staff has the right to decline comments that are outside of those guidelines. Um, when you leave a comment, it's very easy. You simply click this blue button, and when you do so, your full name and your employee ID number display along with the date you left the comment. Um, and then once the comment is published, I can like this comment, I can reply to this comment, and uh, uh, comments are nested in such a way so that I could see that I'm having a conversation with this employee. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the comments feature as we go, but um, but those are the basic um, the basic anatomy of our uh, our internet and how we use it to share news and, and a little bit about a story. So I'm just going to hop back over into the slide deck here. So here's a couple of story examples that I can share with you that I think demonstrate how we use compelling content to just increase staff interest and engagement in the news we have to share. This story had great internal traffic through our normal employee newsletter, Superhero Window Washers over at the Children's Hospital. It was the highest read story of the week. And I think, you know, the reason if you use any kind of your news knows, 
Um, there was a great visual here. It involved kids. What a, a super topic, recognizable, something a lot of people can identify with or would be interested in. And it makes you feel something. So that's one, one instance of content that I think really helped us um, have better interactivity with the content we were sharing. Another example is a story uh, about one of our staff who is not a trained artist, but he is artistic and he uses his um, artistic skills to help um, to help with his patient care role. So we published a story about this staff person on one of our blogs called In The Loop. It was mailed to about 7,000 subscribers. Great story, got a lot of nice traffic. We took that story and we published it on our internal news center that I just showed you, um, sort of like syndicated content. Um, we shared it there and it got another 15,000 views. Um, lots of great employee comments, people feeling a lot of pride and um, the work of their colleagues and feeling good about the work they do at Mayo Clinic. And then we took and we shared it on Facebook, our Mayo Clinic Facebook page, as well as our employee Facebook page. Um, so this is just a, a really nice example of how we took what could have been a good story shared with 7,000 people, um, but we used our social tools and some interactivity to help expand our reach um, and get this story into the hands of more staff. So I'm not going to get into video with a ton of depth, but I do want to show a couple of clips um, that illustrate how we used video to, to tell a story over time uh, that allowed us to give staff a deeper, richer experience with the content. So I'm going to show you three videos that are all about a specific project. Um, in 2010, we launched a new strategic plan. Uh, it, we'd just come through, you'll recall, the economic downturn of 2008. It was a pretty scary time um, for a lot of people, particularly healthcare. Um, and so our CEO, we worked together to create a new strategic plan and he told us the most important thing you can communicate about this plan is to let every employee know that they have a role to play in the success of this strategic plan and of the success of Mayo Clinic, that we are counting on them. Every single person has something to do with this. Um, so we named the plan, we called it the Mayo Effect, and we used a video in conjunction with other tools to launch the new campaign. So what you're about to see here is um, candid, transparent information about the tough times that we'd come through and the decision-making process that we'd went through to lead us to create this plan. You'll see that focus on the role of staff and that real call to action that we're counting on you. Um, we used a new form of video that at that time we hadn't seen a lot internally. It was a deviation from kind of your typical corporate video. Um, and everything in this video is true to our culture. Employees will sense the authenticity. So, you know, you can make a shiny video, but if your message isn't authentic, um, employees will sniff that out. Um, but I also want to just point out that this video is not a standalone tool. We used it um, as a part of a series of face-to-face -face meetings to launch the campaign. So our CEO did 27 face-to-face -face meetings over the course of six weeks. Um, so that this video was kind of a springboard, but there were many, many other tools and traditional um, employee communication tools that supported this. So it's about three or four minutes long and I'll just play it and you guys can take a look. All right, it looks like we're not going to have sound, so this will be much less dramatic. Um, but you can actually go out to YouTube, and if you search for the Mayo Effect, you'll be able we'll to see this. You'll see this video, and Lee will post the link um, so that it'll be here. But you can see um, sort of the animation and um, the transparency. We we stood up in front of our staff and said, "We're not immune to this um, economic issue." and we have to think about working differently and we need your help to do it. So this will just give you a little bit of a teaser, I think, um, as far as uh, how we use video to, to share this information. 
So I, we're probably not going to have sound for any of these videos then, right? Not right now. All right. So apologies for this for the sound problems. I'll do my best to narrate here, and you can check out the links later. So um, just trust me, the video was very powerful, very compelling. So um, after we so after we um, launched that video, we invited staff. We invited staff to um, participate in a movie challenge. So I'm gonna. Let me just back up a second because we don't have the videos here. So we launched with the official video with all of our staff meetings. There was one department um, in Mayo Clinic that was so inspired by this content that they decided to create their own video. So um, they took the content that we had provided in our staff meetings and they decided that they were going to make a video for their own department. It showed incredible understanding and application of the concepts in the plan. It expressed this desire to be part of a solution and want to know more. It, it involved their team in a personal and fun way. And it was just, I mean, as far as staff engagement is concerned, it was really the holy grail of you've got people that just on their own say, I like this corporate communication and this content so much, I want to talk about our strategic plan. So they created a video, um, and I'm not going to show it because it's, it's really a song. It's a, a parody of a, a, a Johnny Cash song, but or I think it's Johnny Cash. Anyway, um, so that'll be available on YouTube as well. Um, but you can't force people to do that. You can't make it up. If people don't feel it, they will not, you know, take the ball and run with it. So this was a real nice success example of how people had gotten the message and the content was so compelling that they decided to make their own video. So after that happened, we launched the next phase of the project, and that was to invite all of our staff to create their own videos. Um, and we created something called the My Mayo Movie Challenge. Um, and again, apologies that I can't show you this one either, but um, we had more than 60 submissions of people that submitted their own videos expressing what's My Mayo effect? What the work that I do here, how does that um, articulate our strategic plan? And that may not sound like that many, but those 60 videos generated thousands of employee views, employee comments, um, votes for their favorites. Um, the contest was focused on the content of the video, not the production quality. So we had a lot of people with their smartphones um, taking videos themselves. We had a, a lot of sort of homegrown videos of people, you know, singing songs and changing the words, um, people in conference rooms doing role plays and skits. Um, it was it was just really um, organic content. Um, I would say if, if you're looking to do a video contest, and we could talk for, at length about that particular tactic, um, you really have to be sure that your staff can articulate the concepts that you're asking for before you launch it. So it sounds like a cool project and something fun to do, but um, for us with the Mayo Effect, we spent more than a year communicating about the strategic plan, what the expectation was for staff, we surveyed our staff so that we knew that 86% of them could articulate the Mayo effect in their own words. So we were really confident that our staff were going to give us videos that we could use. They were going to um, have content in their videos that was going to be something we would want to share that would reinforce the messages of our strategic plan. If you're not confident about that, hold off until you are because the last thing you want is to launch a public video contest amongst your staff and then either not get submissions or not get usable submissions. Um, so I had intended to show you the winning video, but I can just tell you that it came out of our food services group in Arizona. So they made the video themselves, and then they rallied around their staff to get just thousands and thousands of votes. They overtook the competition, and I think the whole Arizona campus was kind of rooting for their team. Um, but the best part is what the team wrote when they submitted their video. So it's a video uh, where they just show their, their food services staff in action. Um, but what they wrote really, I think, explains what their video was all about. And it's exactly what we hoped people would understand about our strategic plan. I um, mean, they were really able to articulate it in their own words. So what they said was, every employee at Mayo Clinic has been hired for a specific reason and purpose. Each employee is responsible for some element of our patient's healing process. The food and nutrition department at Mayo Clinic Hospital is submitting this video to educate and inform all other employee areas of the Mayo Clinic organization about the work that is performed daily to provide the best care and service to our patients and visitors. Our video moves through the various departmental areas and shows what contribution the employees in the food and nutrition department make to the Mayo Effect. Thank you for this opportunity. Our entire department enjoyed and benefited from this experience. 
So um, this one we will try to post out there as well, but it's an internal link and we may have trouble with this one. Um, but so if this sort of um, stuff sounds interesting to you and you'd like to implement some of these strategies, I'll tell you a couple of um, tips to help you get started. And that's the, that's the most important tip is just start. Don't wait until you have everything all buttoned up. Just get going. So you need to have everything just right out of the gate. It's okay to evolve, particularly when it comes to getting that leadership buy-in. Many leaders are used to controlling the message, especially internally. So asking your leadership to partner with you and trust your expertise is the first step. Uh, you'll have to help your leaders um, get comfortable as they move from sort of doing the communicating to facilitating the conversation. That's the next thing. And it's an iterative process, so don't be afraid to just go one step at a time. Your leadership might not be ready to start their own blog and, and get all active with um, you know, what they view as sort of new so social media tools. That's all right. Um, but they might be interested in piloting a small group on Yammer or taking a, a small initiative to better understand how your organization can use tools to help connect with your staff. The next thing you should do is give your employees options so that they can engage with your content in a way that's most comfortable for them. So when I showed you that comments feature, I mentioned um, sort of passive and active communication. So at Mayo, everybody can comment on an article. They can recommend an article, they can leave a comment, they can like a comment. Everybody's got a different comfort level. So we give a lot of options so that employees have an easy way to engage and share their opinion actively if they want to put their name out there and have a conversation, or passively if they just want to quietly like a comment or recommend an article. Um, they can do so at their comfort level. The third thing is to create clear policies. I mentioned that social media code of ethics earlier. Our policies when it comes to social media are very clear. We post them on our public affairs internet page for staff, and we direct our employees to these guidelines on a routine basis. Now that news delivery is more than just this one-way push of information, don't overlook communicating the rules of the road. Employees need to know what's expected, and that includes my own colleagues in public affairs. So those clear policies really help my team to be consistent and make confident news delivery and social media decisions, and they let our staff be confident that they're participating with social media tools at work in the appropriate way. So once you've got those clear policies, enforce them and promote them. Most of your employees, at least our experience has been, is that they engage in respectful and productive online discussion, but not everybody does. At Mayo, our stance is that employees should behave online with the same level of professionalism that they would use in person, and we actively promote that expectation. So remain civil, stay on topic, stop shouting in all caps. Employees know what we expect, and we enforce those behaviors. We reserve the right to decline to publish a comment if it's outside of our mutual respect policies. Um, I do think it's important to note that there's a difference between a public forum and an employee forum. I think organizations can be afraid to jump into social tools because they've seen sort of the frenzy that online blogs can become. Um, but internally, guidelines, strategies, a, a certain level of monitoring that's consistent with your organization's culture, um, all of those things work together to ensure that your internal online conversation is work-related, that it's on topic, and that it stays productive if that is what you wish to create. That's what we wanted to create here. And so that's what we've done. Um, your corporate culture may be different. You know, it's a good thing when employees start talking within the organization. Um, and it's my job to try to make sure that that experience with social media at work is as productive as possible. A corporate forum is not the place for an online rant. You can't just say anything you feel like because you're still at work. That's our stance. And it's OK to make that expectation clear. You need to be sure that you also offer some education and training for your employees and your stakeholders. You might have heard about some of the ways that we train our employees here at Mayo Clinic before. So we have a training video that we show at our new employee orientation. We publish articles about social tools in our traditional newsletters. So we give employees some tips and guidelines and success stories to remind them if you're not out there yet with social, you can. You can, you can take that step. Um, we offer training for subject matter experts who are going to be responding to all those employee comments. Um, we do that in the form of presentations. We even do one-on-one -on -one training for high-use groups. So you can bet that our, our benefits staff, those are certainly people that we stay closely connected with because they're going to get a lot of employee comments and they need to feel comfortable responding and they need to know how to do that in an appropriate way. 
then we also support new users as they learn to use the, use the tools. We try to give them um, some appropriate support. The last thing I would say is to make it easy. So this is an example. Because that comments feature displays on every single article that we run internally, a comments designee is assigned to every article. So it's a required field on our submission form, and it ensures that somebody's responsible for monitoring and responding to the online conversation. When you sign up as a comments designee, every time somebody leaves a comment on your article, you get an automatically generated email. And that email says a comment has been published, it links right to the article so you can see it and the conversation that's happening around it, and then it gives you some tips for responding so that you know how to get involved. So we just make it really easy um, for our subject matter experts to be a part of the conversation. So I'm going to talk a, just a couple minutes about metrics because I do think that's a critical piece of, of your news delivery strategy and, and knowing if you're successful or not. Um, the most important thing is that I think you need to measure information that's meaningful and that will help you achieve your goals, not just stuff that's easy to measure. So really define your news delivery goal and then measure things that help you know if you're being successful, if you're mapping up to that. So you really need that well-defined vision about where you wanna go. So for our case, I mentioned we wanted to create an online community that was collaborative and a place for learning. So to ensure that we were meeting those goals, we measure and analyze um, just some basic stats, just to get a base level, right? The number of comments we're getting, the total number of people who are commenting, the number of comments per commenter. Um, we look at articles um, to see what content people are commenting on. Are they talking about operational things and benefits? Or are they talking about strategy? Um, and then we look at that passive versus active engagement. So how are our employees interacting with our, com with our content? Once you've got some metrics, share what you know. Raw data is just not useful. You have to package it in a way that can be useful. So I'm gonna, there's some ways, the, on the screen you see some ways that we share what we measure to make sure that this information doesn't just gather dust in a drawer. We do a metrics minute for our entire division to tell them what we're measuring and how we're using it at every single meeting. We hold brown bag sessions so we can teach other people how to measure. Um, we, di we display our measurement with some engaging visuals, and I'll show you that in a second. And then the data we collect is useful. It's practical stuff that you can actually do something with. This um, is an example. So this is uh, one of the ways that we share our engagement statistics. These are all of what we would call our internal social media channels. So just putting it in a visual format like this really helps people understand. In this case, we were measuring the likes, the comments, the recommends, the shares, et cetera, for each of our channels. And then we were noting if it was more or less than the month before to help us gauge if we were making any progress. So it's a quick and easy snapshot of our outcomes and it maps directly to our goal of having an engaged workforce. So we can take this information and we can connect it back to our content. Um, you can see in that top left corner that we were down 506 unique active commenters in our internal news center in this month. I think it was August of last year. So why? What stories did we run that month? How many stories did we have? Was it just that there wasn't a lot of content or that the content wasn't compelling? Um, was this a trend month after month we're seeing a decline or was this an anomaly? So that, when you show it this way, it really lets your staff dig in and say, what was going on with that to cause that decline? This is data from an employee publication um, that's hosted on an external server, server because it focuses on this really inspirational, feel-good content about all the amazing stuff that's happening here at Mayo. And we would love for our employees to share this content, but we took a survey and we learned that nobody's doing it. So 87% of readers never share the content that's on this blog through any of their social media tools. Only 12% sometimes do. There's this sad little 1% of people that often share the content, and that's what we want to have happen. So we, we dug into the data, and we think actually that our staff in a healthcare environment, they're so used to patient privacy that we don't think they understand that they can share this content, that it's okay to put this on their Facebook page and to share it with their friends and neighbors. So we're making some changes um, to how we promote the ability to share, um, how we talk about sharing, and how we encourage our staff to see if we can change that. And we'll survey again um, to see if we're making any progress. So I'm just gonna talk for a second about sentiment analysis. This is a form of measurement that we have found um, particularly useful. In that comment section online, um, sentiment analysis helps us define what we would call a quality interaction or a comment that is sort of helpful or productive to the online community or to members of the organization. 
Um, and this is kind of letting us better work with our stakeholders and gain even stronger leadership buy-in. So for us to determine if a comment is quality, we would use a few specific criteria. We would ask, you know, is a comment productive? Does it involve communication with colleagues or subject matter experts? Um, employee comments that ask and answer questions are supporting that learning environment that we hope to create online. And even employee comments that express disagreement or are negative, they can help to build a constructive environment. So we sort of use this formula to figure out what a quality comment is. We also look at employee comments that enrich Mayo's culture by making others feel good about working here. So comments that contain personal stories, um, that talk about shared experiences, or comments that express that pride or gratitude or um, that inspiration about their work. All of those contribute to what we would consider a quality conversation. On the flip side, comments that are outside of our guidelines that we, that we decline to publish, they can help us understand um, the conversation that is not quality. So if they're not approved to be published, we can look and see, you know, personal tax, dismissive language. Those are things we wouldn't publish, but we can still measure if that conversation is, is happening. Um, and we also have com criteria for comments that might be published, but they're just not constructive. So things that decrease pride, that are just complaints, and they use a lot of exaggeration, um, we use those to measure the non-quality. And then we also look at the strength and tone of a comment. So the strength of a comment, we determine that um, we use things like the number of punctuation marks that are used in a comment. Um, if people are typing in all caps and if they have lots of adjectives describing their strong feelings, that helps us know the strength of a comment. And then we determine tone by the number of positive or negative words that are used. So we've kind of crafted this into a formula that we actually manually go through on a particular topic um, to see what strength and tone is happening in the conversation. And I'll give you an example of how we use sentiment analysis like that to gain a better understanding of employee perceptions and to guide some of those internal stakeholders that we advise. So this is um, an analysis um, of the communication we did about our influenza vaccination policy. There was a strong perception from the stakeholder team that comments that were made by employees online about flu-related articles were, quote, horrible. Everybody dreaded it. It was this big negative thing. Everybody's got an opinion about vaccinations and about our policy and what it should or shouldn't be. It's a lot of online conversation on this topic. So we went in and we analyzed it. And actually, we were quite surprised to learn that 38% of the comments on the topic were questions. They were answers and they were constructive feedback. And 62% were simple opinions and statements. When we looked at the, the strength and tone, most comments were determined to be high quality and of neutral tone and strength. So we actually were able to go back to that client and say, you know, I know when you see those zingers, you know, those negative comments, they stick with you, but those are an anomaly. By and large, staff are having a very productive conversation. They're asking questions and getting answers. Um, the online conversation is enhancing your communication in this case, and it's quite productive. So. The bottom line to all of this is that your internal communication strategy, it should be thoughtful and strategic, and any social strategies that you include should support your overall internal news delivery goals. Don't be afraid to experiment with what you're doing and evolve over time. Just take it one step at a time. Figure out what expectations are important to you, then set those and uphold them and have clear policies that support them. Make sure you give lots of options for training. Um, and education and make it easy for your staff to participate um, using the tools that you want them to. And don't forget to measure data, accountability, metrics. Those um, are your friends and they will support you in your effort. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions um, well, that anyone might have. Yes, and we, all, we have some uh, some great questions in already. So thanks, uh, thanks for those of you who have uh, put in questions. And we'll be now, um, it, so if you have questions, please do uh, feel free to add those uh, in the box in the upper right side of the, of the post. So we'll just go through the ones that we have so far and uh, keep them coming. So first question we have is how long has your intranet as we see it and as we just saw today uh, been in existence? How do you know what percentage of employees go to the site and read the email newsletter? So our internet has evolved over time. I may get some of the dates wrong, but we've done a series of redesigns. Um, the internet that I showed you today, actually our latest redesign just happened in December. So we are constantly measuring 
um, and looking at our internet for ways that we can improve. So uh, we just added, um, actually we just added threaded comments um, last week. In fact, Monday they debuted. So mm -hmm. that's a brand new change that happened. Um, in December on the 8th, we added those thumbnail images that you saw on our homepage, so more headlines. Those used to just be sort of nondescript links. We added thumbnails because our research indicated that that was a more compelling way to get content to our staff. Um, the last major redesign that we had was in 2011, and that's where we really moved to that interactive photo carousel that, that you see. Um, but we've been doing iterative redesigns ever since. Um, we were at a point um, in the early 2000s and even up into um, 2008 and 2009 where our homepage was kind of a link farm. Um, and so uh, we do a number of surveys. We have um, some partners um, in another part of Mayo Clinic that measure um, user experience and intranet traffic and they help us with some data. We work with our HR partners to measure um, a number of things with our workforce and what they want to see. And then we do a news delivery survey every two years that's very formal. We gather statistically relevant information about how our employees currently get their news and how they prefer to get their news. And that's a very detailed survey that we um, send out to a random sampling of our staff. So um, I could do a whole presentation on the data that we collect, but we, we are able to measure who's clicking on what. Um, and in fact, that redesign I mentioned with the thumbnails, uh, we did a heat map on our homepage and we saw that people were clicking on that photo carousel at the top and then nothing else. So we realized we were really missing a lot of um, bang for the buck when it comes to more headlines, um, that most box about what's being read and recommended, um, and anything really below that photo carousel. So that's part of the impetus for that redesign. So we could talk more about that. But well, you can count on that we will yeah. have you back again <laughs> for another one of these. So uh, second question, uh, upon what platform is your intranet built? Um, that's a trick question, even though you don't know it. So our intranet at Mayo is, um, I would say, decentralized. So most of our intranet um, is being converted to WordPress off of um, something called Contribute. And um, the page that I showed you, the home page, and a handful of top level pages, those are managed centrally. So my team handles that center part of our home page. Um, but once you get below a certain depth, and it's a pretty shallow depth, um, it moves to a decentralized model where we essentially create a page for people and then it's up to them to populate that content. We just simply aren't staffed to manage that level. Um, and in fact, it's not even my team that does that work. Um, but as far as the centralized content, um, our news center that I showed you is, is built on um, .NET, which is a coding language that we use. Mayo likes to do a lot of um, homegrown systems. Um, so .NET powers the news center and the comments feature, but we do use Yammer and WordPress um, for some of the other components that I showed you. And we're always evaluating new systems to see if there's a, a better platform uh, that we could be using. And SharePoint is, it use in, is in use here at Mayo too, though we don't use it for the tools I showed you today. Okay. I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair and then inject a question of mine that I thought would be helpful. Talk a little bit about the real names policy, about going from yeah. just first name and last initial to the yep. full name. So that was a big change for us. We did that one year ago. Um, and if you are interested in social media, I think you'll be sort of interested in the evolution of that. We started our comments feature back in 2010. Um, I wasn't part of the team at that time, but my understanding is that we couldn't find any other corporation that was really um, allowing employees to have that interactive conversation online like you would just on an external blog or an external news media site. So we were really um, pioneers um, in sort of allowing that capability to be had on the inside of an organization. Um, so because we were sort of on the leading edge, we built it in the way that we thought best. And at that time, um, social media was still making people a little bit nervous. You weren't as adept at um, leaving a comment on a place. You weren't putting your every move out on Facebook. Um, it was just less, it was foreign to a lot of people. And the idea of using it at work was um, even more foreign still. So we tried to pick a middle ground, um, particularly in healthcare. A culture of safety is something that's very important in the healthcare environment. And so we only required staff to use their first name when they left a comment. And we thought that that would allow people some level of accountability, but it would allow them some anonymity as well. And we did that until 2013. We processed something like 35,000 or 40,000 comments on our new center during that time. 
and we started to see a shift in social media. So we did a lot of research on um, people had grown more accustomed to certain things. The idea of having an online conversation was not as foreign. Um, we saw that um, a number of blogs were requiring full identity in their comments. And we looked at the quality of conversation taking place here at Mayo, and we looked at our objectives. And we felt like there was a small but vocal minority of people who were dominating the conversation in a way that wasn't as productive as we hoped. Um, we had a lot of problems with our subject matter experts. So somebody would leave a comment, you know, along the lines of, um, I noticed, you know, a massive IT failure in my work unit today. How can I get help? And the IT people would, you know, they'd say, well, we want to help this person, but we don't know who they are, you know, from Tony in a random location. So, um, so we did a lot of research and we made a proposal to our leadership team to convert to last names. I think if we had started with first and last names at the beginning, if we waited a couple of years for things to get a little bit more mainstream, it would have been an, an easy transition. But because we started with first names only and made that made that move, a lot of people supported the change. They felt like it was standard industry standard for social media use. They felt like it would bring a more productive conversation to the online conversation that was happening here. Some people were nervous about it, though. They um, they were starting to use that channel almost like a compliance vehicle where they could raise a concern anonymously, and that's not really its purpose. And so part of our intention was to take back that conversation and really support that goal of collaboration and learning rather than making it an anonymous channel for you to report um, something you don't like about your supervisor or work unit. So we directed staff back to the compliance channels that were more appropriate for that. Um, we've seen a decline in the number of comments that we have, but we've seen a massive increase in the quality of conversation that's happening. Um, we're actually in the process just now, it's been one year, so we're going back to measure to see um, what's worked and what hasn't worked. By and large, I think it's been very successful. I'm really happy with it. I do think we have some gaps. One of those is that I think we may want to create um, another channel to sort of help make sure that we're having that candid conversation. I think we've lost um, some of that just real bare conversation that people felt safe speaking up truly and honestly. They're a little a little less excited about doing that in some cases, I think, because they their name is out there. Anybody can see it. Um, but by and large, if your culture is healthy um, and if people are not afraid to speak up, I think having full transparency is, is the way to go. Another question here, are you, are you using these metrics to cross compare with employee engagement measurements if you found any correlations? So that's where we're moving to. We do a big um, staff satisfaction survey and that um, in 2015, that's what we're looking to move our, our measurement program to. So we actually didn't start our metrics program formally until 2013. We always did some measurement kind of here and there, very uh, one and two off tactical execution things. Um, but in 2013, we decided to create a formal metrics program and that year was by and large spent figuring out what do we need to measure, what can we measure, what type of measurement is going to be meaningful for us. And then in 2014, we kind of put it to the test, measuring things to see what significance we could find. So 2015 is all about making those metrics actionable for us. And I think a big part of that is connecting it to our staff satisfaction survey. So that's exactly where we're going. Okay. How much staff time would you estimate is required for ongoing comment supervision and moderation? Less than you would think. Um, I think that we are up to about 55,000 comments that we've approved. And I didn't mention this in my comments, but we actually manually review um, every single comment before it's published. So you, an employee leaves a comment and it goes to um, two of my team members and they look at it. And if it fits our guidelines, they hit publish. If it doesn't, um, then they decline it. So we have um, kind of a templated process for them so that the employee understands why their comment was declined. Um, and if they'd like to resubmit, what they can do. Um, so we do all of that manually. I don't have a great estimate of time. Um, I have two people that do do that as just a very, very small slice of their job. One of the things that we'll evaluate with that move from first names to last names is if we need to do that level of moderation on the front end any longer. When people just had their first name, we felt that it was an important match to our culture that we did some moderation on the front. Now that people, their identities are out there, they're largely self-policing, though people do still, you'd be surprised what people feel like is appropriate to comment on sometimes. Um, so we'll look at that, but um, it's not a large time commitment at all. I would say those two people probably spend, you know, maybe one to two hours a week um, doing that now that our program is in place. Okay. Well, one of the things you'll note in our conversation here is that we have the incredibly high quality comments that are coming through that don't require Excellent. any moderation whatsoever it's within true. this within it's this true. webinar it's within true. this Living webinar community. Yeah, exactly. So 
and most of them are using their their full names. One um, question, another one is uh, probably a pretty typical one. What does your staffing structure look like to develop, implement, measure, sustain your internal communications engagement efforts system wide? What's the resource investment? Yeah. So for um, news specifically, I I've just had a recent transition, but um, I had a team of about ten people that were um, doing this work as well as supporting our leadership communication and their needs um, and some of our campaigns like the Mayo Effect that I talked about. Um, so a team of about 10 um, supplemented with people from some of our other campuses, um, pieces of them. So that includes, you know, the, the production and the development of the content as well as the um, sort of client consultation on the internal side. Um, I think that it's really scalable. Um, we have one person who serves as the editor of our flagship newsletter that goes out to all 60,000 staff every Friday. We, we publish about 70 to 100 headlines a week in that publication, and that's his full-time job. Um, and then a handful of other people produce niche publications for supervisors or researchers or physicians. Um, and then we do freelance out a lot of our content development. Um, that's something that if you have trusted writers, that's we found to be a good way to let our staff manage the strategies and the infrastructure and have a, a trusted writer produce the content. Another question here, do you use a specific tool for sentiment analysis or is that part of someone's role on the team? That's part of someone's role on the team. Um, I have one team member who has a particular interest in this and she did a lot of her own um, research and training and um, has really become kind of an expert in it and she built the formula um, based on what she learned specific to what our team is looking to measure. So, Do you send a regular email directing staff to the internet? We do. Every Friday we send out something called This Week at Mayo Clinic. It goes by email. There are 10 localized editions so that depending on where you work, you're going to get local news that matters to you as well as um, sort of enterprise news that all employees may care about. Um, and the headlines there take you into that news center online that I showed you. Um, and then we kind of recycle those headlines all week long, um, sort of in a, a reverse daily news model, I guess. Okay. So here's maybe sort of a joint question. How many staff manage social media at Mayo? Yeah, that's, yeah I'll let you take your first staff. <laughs> well, I have some thoughts too. Yeah, so we have about six people, uh, six or seven people that are part of the core social media team that uh, manage the externally facing um, commenting and I mean, we're really, we talked about being the catalyst before, but we really do engage an awful lot of our staff, whether they're media relations or, you know, uh, elsewhere within our communications division, within marketing, uh, to be part of that. Uh, but in terms of managing, we have one person Monday through Friday who's doing most of the day-to-day -day comment uh, moderation. And I would agree with Lee that, you know, I certainly think that all staff in our communications division should be comfortable with and familiar with social media and that they should be able to fold that into their work. So if I have somebody on the internal side that's looking to create a news story for our intranet, I also want them thinking about could we share this on Yammer um, to have to further our reach with our staff? Could we put it on our Facebook page and would we want to share that with the world through the Mayo Clinic page or just with our staff through the employee page? So I think social should, should be a part of everyone's job, um, but we do have people with sort of expertise that we, we rely on. And that's part of the training and support that I talked about too. Sure. Uh, so we're, we're getting right up to the top of the hour. Uh, we're going to have more questions than we will get to. Uh, the beauty of asynchronous social media conversation is that Annie and I, we can, we can uh, go in and be answering some of these questions uh, afterwards. So uh, we'll, the ones that we don't get to, we'll, we'll uh, go, we promise we'll answer online. So please do keep the questions coming. Uh, so this will be the last question that we'll uh, deal with live. How do you ensure that you draw people in? How do you nurture the sharing versus sitting back waiting for folks to engage? How long does it take? So this is a multi-part question. <laughs> How long does this uh, take to click in and be active? If you build it, will they come? Uh, often, if you build it, they will come often fails with uh, knowledge sharing efforts. What investment advice uh, do you have for smaller organizations too? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's really the million dollar question, right? That's what everybody's um, looking to do. And it's, you know, there's always a little bit of a guessing game to know if you're hitting the right balance. Um, I would say smaller organizations can definitely implement these kinds of things. A lot of our work, especially, you know, look going back five to seven years, it was really kind of, you know, experimental. We had some ideas, you know, we had some resources um, and we just sort of tried it out. 
internally that can be a challenge. You know, not every leader is in love with their communication staff experimenting with uh, a, a sort of a public format. Um, so, but I would say, you know, our our first blog, I remember externally, you know, uh, it was about a particular initiative. It was a very closed blog. It was specific to something we were doing, and I think even only staff could see it. Mm -hmm. It was and, behind the firewall. Yep, and the very first comment was a negative comment, and the fallout from that, it was like, there's been a comment. You know, uh, we should get a committee together to address the comment. Let's set up a meeting for within two weeks to talk about the comment. It was just such a foreign concept, and we've come so far. Um, in helping our leaders do that. But I, I really think those strategies of looking at your corporate culture and understanding what, you know, don't focus on the tools because they're just tools. They're, they're a means to accomplishing your goal. Think about your goal, understand your corporate culture and work with your leader's comfort level. Even if you're ready to be four steps ahead, um, think about what your leader is comfortable with.